wanted to ask you, 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 you've <coughs> talked about your addiction issues. Uh, I've never, the, the only presidential hopeful I've ever heard admit that he used any kind of barbiturate was Bill Clinton talking about smoking weed and he didn't inhale. But you're yeah. not. I had help for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's partly what I'm talking about. Like you're very open about the fact that this is a part of your history. And before the interview really kicked off, you talked about having a hole yes, yes. in your soul that you felt like. Shout out to Aerosmith that you felt like you couldn't fill. Yeah, is that what caused you to? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people. You know, I've been going to 12 step meetings. For, I've probably been to, I don't know, 20,000 of them. So mm -hmm. I, you hear p people's stories, and there's a high percentage of people like me who believe they were born with the addiction. And then there's other people who, who think that they got it later on in life, that they crossed the line. And once you, you know, they say, once you become a, uh, if you're a cucumber, once you become a pickle, you can't become a cucumber again. Yeah. That once you cross this certain line, you, you then you know you can't go back. For me, I felt that um, that kind of gnawing, empty hole from when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, um, you know, the first time I took the pledge, like you did, because you were you were saying at the beginning of the, you know, before we started, right. and that you had made this pledge to your dad about um, right. mm -hmm. and that your dad uh, and your dad said when you whenever you first do it you do it with me and then mm -hmm. when your dad died you didn't do it which I'm so you know incredibly impressed well in the Irish Catholic communities that I grew up in uh, there was uh, you, there was a tradition of taking the pledge which mm -hmm. is I will never drink because it was known that our race is disproportionately impacted by um, out, particularly alcohol addiction. It's got we call it the Irish flu. Hmm. Right. Oh, and and they would give you in Catholic school. They would give you a pledge pin that you would wear on your collar, and it, it was I took the pledge. I'm never going to drink for my whole life. <clears throat> Very common in Ireland too, and I did that, um, and I took it seriously. And when my you know my father died when I was 14, and by the time I was 15, I hadn't even never even tasted coffee. Hmm. And that summer, I went to a um, a, uh, a party uh, of the elder brother. This is when I was living in Cape Cod. The elder brother of a friend of mine was uh, had been drafted and was going to Vietnam. And there was a going away party for him, and uh, he didn't want to go. Mm. And at the party, there was a melee, and he ended up hitting a cop and going to jail and he didn't go to Vietnam. But I was hitchhiking home from that party, and an older boy picked me up, who I knew, but not well. And he offered me LSD. And LSD had come to that town that night. This was in 1969. So, um, and I wouldn't have taken it, but there was, that, there was a comic book Okay, I would, we read, there was a little store, the only store in our town was a news store. It sold ice cream, candy, and then the comics. And the comics would come every Tuesday. And my favorite comic was a comic called Turok Sun at Stone, which was about <coughs> these two Indians. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you're nodding your head, I can't even believe that you've heard of it. But, Turok, yeah, I've yeah. definitely heard of Turok. Tur Turok, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's not Tupac, it's Turok. Turok. <laughs> <laughs> I know Torak, man. I know Torak. <laughs> okay, that was a good one. That's my nickname, Torak. Yeah. So anyway, the, the, the week before, there was an episode where the Indians had eaten like peyote or mm. something, and they had had hallucinations. They'd seen dinosaurs. They were like, it was like they had gotten transported back in time. Time, mm. yeah. And, uh, and so when this guy offered it to me, I said, I had an interest in paleontology when I was little. And I said, if I eat that, oh, I see dinosaurs. And he said, you might. <laughs> and, I, and so I took it. Right. And I had this, you know, incredibly vivid hallucinations. And then in the morning, 
you know, it lasted all night. And, you know, when I got in trouble, a lot of people in the town took it that night. And I, um, <laughs> and I was walking home from the town about three miles in the morning, but I was crashing on the truck and I was getting depressed and remorseful and telling myself, I'm never going to do this again. I did something that was wrong. And I, uh, I got, I got near my, and I had to go home and face the music because I had violated my curfew and my mother was, you know, invented tough love mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to get in a lot of trouble. And she, and I, um, I saw these boys in the woods <clears throat> and, uh, and I went in to see what they were doing and I told them, and I, they, they saw me and I said, I'm really crashing on this stuff. And they said, try some of this. And it was, and it, I'd been saying to myself, I'm never going to take a drug again. And they offered me a line of crystal meth. And I snorted it and I felt great. And that was really the template for my addiction for the next 14 years. Of How me, long? Me, 14? 14 years. Mm -hmm. I, I got sober when I was 28. Mm -hmm. yeah. And but I'm constantly um, saying I'm not going to do this again, and then not being able to keep promises to myself. And that, um, you know, I had iron willpower in other parts of my life. Like I gave up candy for Lent when I was 13. I never ate candy again hmm. till I was in college, and I I gave up desserts the next year. And. I, um, I never ate another dessert till I was in college and I was playing rugby at college and was trying to bulk up, so I started eating desserts again. But I felt like I could do anything with my willpower, but somehow I, it was impervious to the, the, the addiction. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work against it. I was cunning, baffling, powerful, and the most demoralizing part of addiction is not being able to keep contracts with yourself. Mm -hmm. Of telling yourself, I'm going to do this and then doing it, or I'm not going to do that. And then, you know, four hours late, and believing earnestly, sincerely, honestly, mm -hmm. I'm not going to ever do that again. And four hours later, you're doing it, and you don't know how it happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's really demoralizing. What snatched you out of it? Well, then I got so I my progression was very fast. Addiction <coughs> is always progressive; it always gets worse, and I. My drug of choice was heroin, so within four weeks of that, I was shooting heroin. Mm. Mm. And I, I had been around, you know, animals my whole life, and and given them hypodermic needles, and it made sense to me, um, you know, that it would be more efficient to uh, to inject the drug. So I, I, you know, I did that, and I was addicted for until I was 28 years old, and then I got sober. I was trying the whole time. I just didn't know how to do it. And I would go for weeks. I would go for months. What was the difference in 28? And, well, I got into a 12-step program. Mm -hmm. And then and I had a spiritual awakening. And it was like, it was lifted. So, and it, you know, it was, it was like a miracle, as much a miracle for me as if I'd been able to walk on water. Because I had tried, really tried in every way and could not do it on my own. And then I did that, you know, the... Well, that programs are designed to induce a spiritual awakening, a, a, a profound spiritual realignment. And, uh, and I had that very, very quickly in the program. And as soon as I committed myself, it happened to me. And, I, and you know, it just disappeared. Did you go willingly to the Twilight program or somebody Oh, I was, you to go? no. What happened is I got arrested. Mm. And I got arrested. On an airplane, um, somebody saw me going in the bathroom. I was actually on my way to a rehab, but before I went to the oh, rehab, damn. I stopped on 106th Street mm -hmm. to cop. And then I went out to LaGuardia and I was flying out to the rehab in, in, uh, in Minnesota. But I, you know, I got one last one before going, and right. somebody saw me on the airplane going in the bathroom with it. And when I landed, and when I landed, the police arrested me. Wow. But what I, it was a good thing for me because I could, because of my name, because of my notoriety, I could have never gone into a meeting and, you know, and and and, and spoken truthfully about my life hmm. because I was guarded, you know, and I I'd been you know raised in a family where if you talked about stuff publicly, it would you know the, it would be in the papers. Yeah. yeah. And so it was an impossible situation. But as soon as that happened, there was nothing to hide anymore. 
and I was able to go to these meetings and get, you know, and talk honestly. And, um, and so it was like a gift for me. The arrest I knew was, was probably the greatest gift I got because it gave me then access to the 12 step programs and to the arrest, you know, the spiritual awakening. Yeah. And I want to ask, what was the spiritual awakening if you don't mind us asking? Well, I'll tell you what happened is that I, I knew, you know, I had been struggling all of this time to quit, right? And um, so, and I didn't want to be my life to be that, okay, I'm going to quit, but I'm going to be white knuckling it the whole time and thinking about it and stuff. I, I was like, how do I, how do I just become a different person who some, a person who never thinks about it, hmm. like a normal person. Wow. And I knew I had read the lives of the saints, you know, St. Augustine had been an alcoholic and then he had a spiritual awakening and walked away St. Francis of Assisi. So I knew it happened to other people. I had a friend my, who, who was best friends with my brother. I had two brothers who died of this, <laughs> this disease of, of addiction or addiction related um, uh, deaths. One of them, you know, skied into a tree. Um, but but the, this guy was a friend, really close friend of my brother's, and he used to take drugs with us. He'd take them with the same fanaticism that I had, the same compulsion, the same impulse that was uncontrollable. And then he joined the Unification Church and be, became a Mooney. Right? Do you guys know what that is? No. no. It's, a, it's like a cult. Like, uh, there's a Korean guy called Reverend Sun Young Moon. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. yeah. And, and he has a lot of followers. And this guy joined it. And he had a spiritual awakening. And he didn't want to take drugs anymore. And he would be with us. And I'd be taking drugs in front of him. But he didn't want them. And I used to think about this guy, you know, when I, when I was... After you know, I got arrested, and I knew that I I had to get sober. I would think about this guy, and I would say to myself, "I'd rather be dead than be a Mooney." But I wish that I could get whatever it was, distill whatever it was that allowed him to be impervious to this impulse, without becoming a religious nuisance, right. you know, <laughs> or a, like a cult member yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. And um. And then I, I picked up a book by Carl Jung that was just sitting on the on the you know on a table somewhere, and it was called Synchronicity. Synchronicity. And the word synchronicity means it means coincidence, kind of. It's like it's the kind of coincidence that happens if you're if you're talking about somebody that you haven't thought about in 20 years. And they show up. And they, they, yeah, they, they show up and the phone rings. And it's like, I have the phone. And that's synchronicity. Well, Carl Jung was, and the reason I picked that, that book up is because there was an album by the police at that time by the same name. I didn't know what the word meant. Mm -hmm. I started reading it. And Jung was the one of the fathers of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. He was a, um, Sigmund Freud was his mentor. Yep. But Freud was an atheist, and Jung was a deeply spiritual man. He had these incredible spiritual experiences starting when he was three or four years old, very authentic experiences. And his form of psychiatry is very connected to spiritual transformations. And he had had, a, um, he had this experience one where, where he was sitting in the third floor of his, uh, of his sanitarium. He, he ran the biggest sanitarium in Europe. He was up on the third floor, and he's and a, with a patient. It was a woman, and she's talking to him, and she's talking about a dream. And he was very much, um, you know, his his style therapy is very oriented towards dream interpretation. Right. She was telling him about this dream, and the the fulcrum of that dream was a scarab beetle, which is a creature that is uh, it's a piece of iconography on the on the hieroglyphics in, right. in Egypt and right. on the obelisk the tombs it really doesn't exist in northern Europe right. where he was so he's hearing while he's talking to this woman he's hearing this bing 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 on the window behind him 
and he doesn't want to turn and take his attention away from his patient. But finally, he gets exasperated, and he swings around, and he throws open the window, and a scarab yeah, beetle flies, flies in, lands in his palm. Wow. And he turns, and he shows it to the woman. He says, this is what you were dreaming about. And she goes, yeah. So he, th he wow. thought these little incidents of synchronicity are, are God's way of cutting through the rules and regulations that God had set up, like the rules of mathematics and nature and physics. Right. And every once in a while, he breaks his own rules and comes in and, and taps you on the shoulder. Mm. And, you know, because the, the chance of that happening are one in a trillion. In a trillion, It yeah. never happened, right? But, but it seems so obvious, like, <laughs> yeah. you just said it, and this happened. <laughs> yeah. It has to be connected. It has to be connected. Yeah. And, and scar he said, scarabs, I believe, they represent new life. Yeah, well, but, but they, they, have, they have all this kind of spiritual significance, right? right? But um, he... But he had this, uh, so he then tried to reproduce that in a clinical setting. So he would put one guy in one room and the other guy in another room, and he'd have them flip cards, and then guess what the other guy flipped. And he thought that if he could, if he could beat the laws of chance, beat the laws of, of nature, the natural law, he would have proven the existence of a, super, of a supernatural, of some force that was not explained by natural law. Right. by the laws of mathematics or chance or whatever. Mm. But he's never able to do that. Mm. So in this book, he says, I can't prove the existence of a God using empirical tools or scientific tools. But he said, having seen tens of thousands of patients come through his hospital, I can prove that people who believe in God get better faster and that their recovery is more enduring than people who don't. Hmm. Oh, in that sense, it's irrelevant if there's a God up there. If you believe in one, your chance of living a happy life are better. Right. That's what he was saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was really significant for me. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was much more significant than if, if he had said, I proved the existence of a God, which I wouldn't have believed. But him saying that I can improve your chance, I can improve my chances of recovering, of never having to take this drug again if I believe in God. I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. So then I had the problem of how do you start how do you start um, believing in something that you can't see or smell or touch or feel or acquire with your senses? Right? And he gives the solution. You fake it till you make it. You act as if. And um and so that's what I did. I started saying, okay, I'm just going to act as if there's a God up there watching me all the time, and life is just a series of tests, and that I have to behave myself even when I don't have an audience. I have to do the right thing, it's right? Already, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, and so, you know, and, uh, and, I, and every day is broken down into like 40 little choices, and each one for me now has a moral implication. So mm -hmm. when I... When I wake up in the morning, um, the alarm goes off. You know, do I lie in bed for an extra 15 minutes with my indolent pornographic thoughts, or do I get jumped right out of bed? And then uh, when I go, do I brush my teeth? Do I hang up the towels? Where you know, when I, do I make the bed? That's the most important decision every day. Yes, you start yes, out making yes, the bed. Yes. Do I put the water in the ice tray before I put the ice tray back in the freezer, right? Do I, when I reach into my closet and pull out a pair of blue jeans and all those little wire hangers fall on the floor, do I actually go and hang them back up or do I say, you know, that's somebody else's job. I'm too much of a big shot for that job, right? Uh -huh. Do I put the shopping cart where the shopping cart is supposed to go, you know, when, when I, or do I leave it in the middle of the parking lot like everybody else does? <laughs> <laughs> and I, had, I had this experience when I was, when I first got sober, and my life had gotten very small through addiction, and it started getting big very quickly when I, you know, when I got sober. And I was running through National Airport, and I was at, there was a plane that I was going to miss, and it was mission critical that I got on that airplane. I had to get on it. You know, I would have been late for the appointment, and it was, it was, it was a whole bunch of consequences that would have happened. So I had to get that plane, and I was going to miss it. And I'm running through the airport, and I put a, a stick of dentine in my mouth, and I, I'm rolling up the 
the wrapper, and as I'm running, I, I threw the wrapper into a garbage can, and it went, did a perfect arc, swish right in the middle. <laughs> but Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> but out of the corner of my eye, I saw it must have hit something in there because it jumped back out and landed oh, on the ground. But I was like, that, that's God's fault because I made the show. <laughs> so I was running, running, trying to get the plane, but it, then it just started eating at me. And I got about 50 feet down. And I went, God, I got to go back, go back and, pick it up. and pick it up. But that, you know, I ended up making the plane, but that to me was probably the most important thing I did that day because that's, Mm. You know, maintaining that posture of surrender. When your life is broken and everything's going wrong, it's easy to be, you know, in surrender to God. But when all the cash and prizes start flowing back in, you know, my inclination is to say, okay, thanks, God, I got it from here. And I take the wheel and drive the car off the cliff again. <laughs> you know, mm. and, uh, mm. but I'll, I'll tell you the answer to your question very quickly of what happened to me the day that I finished reading that book, um, Synchronicity, I went out to play volleyball. And, um, you know, so the synchronicity is about all these coincidences, and I go out to play volleyball, and they, somebody hits the volleyball in this very powerful, uh, you know, hit at, where, where it went up on a kind of an errant flight, and it comes down and it hits the top of the post. And as it's going up again, I said out loud, that ball is going to get hit by a Mack truck. I said it. I don't know why I said it, but I said it. And everybody heard me say it. And then the ball went up again. It came down. And it hit the top of a chain link fence. And it dropped on the other side. And then it rolled down this driveway for about, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet out into the middle of a, of a little highway. And a big 18-wheeler with a bulldog on the front comes and pops it, you know, bang, pop. That's crazy. <laughs> everybody says, everybody looks at me for a second like, wow. Wow. How'd you know that? Really and then they went on. But, you know, for me, it was significant because I just finished that book, book and went out and then it happened. <coughs> and, it, and it was like, okay. So uh, I'm reaching out. It was like, that was a cheap, yeah. you know, poor man's spiritual awakening. But that's what it was. You know? Right. I mean, that's it that's works. Real. Yeah. yeah. But worse, no. uh, you but it, it, it opened me to start looking at those things and saying, you know, I should pay attention to those things when they happen instead of just dismissing them. This hot for trap trapper turns smack rapper. Only smack rapper that you know is smack rappers. Got bars I can hang with the backpackers. Trap star, I don't hang with the backpackers. I'm in the hood with the work you heard. Making fiends leave earth you heard. Got your baby mama thirst you heard. Feel the flow, nigga, throw it in reverse. This the way you need to serve you heard.